This week on Waterways. Tracking the endangered sawfish. And marine life collectors. Sometimes, the last few remaining members of an endangered species hole up in remote, isolated places. Scientists have to travel miles through the wilds just to find evidence of one animal. The Everglades' 10,000 Island Coast is one of the most remote, complex coastal locations in the United States. Swimming in its mangrove creeks and estuaries is another hard-to-find endangered species, the small-tooth sawfish. To search for the sawfish in the murky waters near Flamingo, scientists use a simple technique. Fishing. So what we're doing now is setting a long line and it uh, basically consists of a rope that sits on the bottom and we have it anchored at either end with a red float. The red float is so that we can find it when we go back. Um, the rope itself is about 800 meters long and We'll string about 50 to 60 of the ganjin hooks on the long line. Uh, those will sit on the bottom as well. Sawfish uh, tend to feed off the bottom as sharks do. Though people often think a sawfish is a type of shark, it's more closely related to the shark's evolutionary cousin, the ray. The most conspicuous part of a sawfish's anatomy is its saw. The saw is a long piece of cartilage studded with sharp teeth. The sawfish uses the tooth-studded saw to dig in the mud and harvest mollusks, crabs, and other crustaceans. When sawfish get larger, they can swim through schools of mullet and jack while using their sharp snouts to stun and even fillet the smaller prey fish. Small-tooth sawfishes commonly grow to 18 feet. The small-tooth is one of seven species of sawfish worldwide and is the only species that scientists know still exists in U.S. waters. Historically, we had two species, the small-tooth sawfish and also the large-tooth sawfish. The large-tooth sawfish was found mostly in Texas and Mexico. We haven't had any reports of, of that species in the United States since the early 1900s. Uh, so now the species that we have in the United States is the small tooth sawfish. Tonya and her crew put in weeks of time in isolated corners of southwest Florida just to get one fish. When we're doing the field studies, we generally spend two to three weeks a month in the field and we fish all the way from Tampa Bay uh, to the Marquesas Keys. Um, we'll, we use mostly long lines to, to catch them and We'll generally fish uh, six to eight long lines a day, so that's four or five hundred hooks that we'll fish in a day. Uh, and despite all that effort that we put in, going to areas where we know people have encountered sawfish and where we think there are sawfish, we still only generally catch one about every three months. If the sawfish is so rare, how did scientists know it was in trouble? The answer is, it wasn't always so rare. It is a species of concern. It was uh, listed endangered by National Marine Fisheries Service in 2003. The numbers have declined dramatically over the last hundred years. The range in which they're found has declined dramatically. They used to be found in the Gulf of Mexico, all the way from Texas to Florida, and up the Atlantic to the Carolinas, and occasionally as far as New Jersey. And now they're found in South Florida. We do occasionally get reports out of Florida. We've had a couple from Georgia the last couple years but they're found mostly in Florida and mostly in South Florida in Everglades National Park and the Keys. In deciding to declare the small-toothed sawfish endangered, scientists pored over old natural history journals, fishing records, and newspaper stories. They found that after 1963, there were no reports of the sawfish north of Georgia. The sawfish also disappeared from the Gulf. After 1971, there were only three records of sawfish in the Gulf outside of Florida. Things looked grim, but scientists came across one set of records that gave them some hope. 
For 40 years, Everglades National Park has been interviewing anglers about what they catch, whether they keep it or not. This so-called creel survey showed that anglers were catching sawfish. Though the catches weren't common, they were consistent year after year, suggesting that a sustainable population of sawfish was hanging on in the remote reaches of Florida Bay and the Florida Keys. Armed with this information, they recommended that the sawfish be declared endangered. They then set out to discover what they could about the population that survived in Florida Bay. Well, amazingly, for, for such a unique animal, the sawfish in the United States had never been studied before. And when National Marine Fisheries was petitioned to list them endangered, uh, they started looking at what was known about them, looking at all the data, and there wasn't very much. Uh, they had never been studied before, so it was mostly anecdotal information. We started this project in 1999 to address all these inadequacies in the data um, so that we can provide the scientific data on which to base effective conservation measures and uh, protect the species from going extinct. Tonya and her field assistants are from the Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota, Florida. They worked for Moat's Center for Shark Research, the world's largest research facility dedicated to the study of sharks and their relatives, skates and rays. Uh, so now we're pulling in the long line. It's soaked for an hour and a half and we're pulling it in now, seeing what we caught. Yeah, the, the hooks are coming up without bait on them. Uh, generally, after the hooks have been in for about an hour and a half, the crabs have managed to pick clean any baits which have remained on the hooks. So there's no, really no point in leaving the long lines in any longer. Moat uses two tools to learn about sawfish. The first is long lining for sawfish and tagging them. So this is a satellite tag. This is a pop-off archival tag that if we catch a sawfish that's uh, six feet long or larger, we'll attach this to the animal. Um, this tag will actually record the depth that the animal's swimming in um, the light level, which we can infer um, location from, and the water temperature. What it'll do at the, at, when we've told it to uh, pop off, this little wire in here will burn off, and this will pop up to the surface, and it'll send all its stored data to the satellite, which will then email us that information. One of the many things that we don't know about sawfish is where they mate, and when they mate, um, how far they move, and so using this technology, we're able to um, get three months worth of information from an adult sawfish on, on where they're moving, what kind of habitats they're using. Wiley also takes a small piece of the sawfish's fin that is later sent out for genetic analysis. Other researchers are working on sawfish genetics, studying to see if the gene pool for sawfish is as reduced as their overall numbers. The second tool Moat uses to learn about sawfish is reports of sightings by anglers. It was Everglades National Park's angler surveys that first told scientists sawfish were alive and well in South Florida. Moat is using the survey to keep track of sawfish numbers. They've also set up a hotline to tap the tens of thousands of anglers that fish Keys waters every year. To date, over 650 anglers have reported seeing 1,016 sawfish. Moat then puts these records in a master database. Hopefully, between the Moat database and data collected by Everglades National Park, resource managers can forecast the recovery of sawfish in and adjacent to the national park. We're able to enter that in a database and map it out and see what sizes of animals are found in certain places, if there's any kind of seasonality to when and where they're found in areas. Um, and it also, that also helps us to target our field research. Though Moat has recorded isolated sightings as far away as the Florida Panhandle, Georgia, and the Marquesas, most come from the Everglades, 10,000 Islands Coast, and Florida Bay. The fact that most of the sightings come from sparsely populated wild places is a hint to scientists about one possible cause of the sawfish's decline. The sawfish lives in shallow coastal bays and lagoons. These are the same places where people love to live. Over the past hundred years, many of Florida's shallow estuaries have been heavily settled. People have built seawalls, dredged channels, and filled wetlands. 
scientists think that these changes might have made some of Florida's bays unsuitable for sawfish. While development might have destroyed sawfish habitat and might keep sawfish from recolonizing their historic range, it is probably only a secondary cause of the animal's decline. The biggest killer of sawfish over the past 200 years has been fishing bycatch. Bycatch is the word people use to describe species they catch accidentally while they're fishing for something else. Sawfish live in the same places where commercial boats fish for shrimp and mullet. While trawlers and gill netters don't target the sawfish, the sawfish's jagged saw gets easily tangled in their nets. In years past, when they did catch a sawfish, fishermen would kill the animal or cut off its saw to prevent damage to crew, boat, and nets. Tonya and her team are familiar with bycatch. It's a part of their work, too. Although the team would like to see one sawfish for every hook on the line, the fish is too rare to catch often. Instead of sawfish, Tonya's hooks often pull up all manner of large and small fish. Tonya's bycatch is luckier than sawfish were in days past. They are safely released and they serve the advancement of science. Our most predominant bycatch is the gaff top sail catfish. We tend to catch them everywhere we go. Um, after that, we catch mostly bull sharks, lemon sharks, and nurse sharks. Um, the shark bycatch is, is very good for us. We're still able to get data from that. Uh, we tag all of the animals, all the sharks that we catch. Um, we take measurements on all of the animals. Um, so it, it's, it's good data that we can take back. We've, we have five years worth of data from the sawfish project on all the bycatch that we've caught. So everything that we catch gets recorded. Um, it's data that we have and, and hopefully can be used by, by someone or by us in the future. Since 2000, Wiley and her crew have caught and tagged over 1,000 sharks. Of those, 20 have been recaptured, demonstrating migration patterns. And along with data such as overall sex ratios and baseline population densities, they've also discovered a prime nursing area for bull sharks in Coot Bay. One of the most important aspects of these sawfish conservation efforts is one that everyone on the water can lend a hand with. Several things that the public can do to help us and to help the marine environment in general. Um, first and foremost, if they catch or see a sawfish while they're out boating or diving or fishing, um, we'd love to get that information on when and where they saw it. If they have any photos or video of the animal, um, we can count the number of teeth on the saw and identify individuals that way. Um, and in addition to that, uh, just supporting conservation efforts, um, you know, protecting the environment, um, reducing pollution, all those things will help the sawfish and, and other animals in the marine environment. If you catch a sawfish, or if you have a sawfish sighting, please call Moat Marine Lab's sawfish hotline at 800-691-6683 or email sawfish at moat.org. While you call, Tonya Wiley will probably still be fishing the banks and channels of the Everglades coast, searching for sawfish and catching sharks on long lines laid out across the sawfish's last refuge. Marine sanctuaries are often compared to national parks. Like the parks on land, they are in places recognized for their unique assets and granted special protection. Unlike national parks, sanctuaries must meet their goal of protecting the environment while accommodating a wide range of commercial and recreational activities. In the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, that means balancing activities as diverse as lobster trapping, underwater photography, and flats fishing. Balancing multiple uses brings challenges for managers, but it also brings rewards, as those who depend on the coral reef ecosystem for their livelihood often become partners in its protection. In the Florida Keys, marine life collectors exemplify such partnerships. Marine life collectors are commercial fishermen and women who collect fish, sponges, crabs, shrimp, there are about 250 different species that are collected and then sold throughout the United States. A 
first started collecting in 1969 as a hobby, kind of driving down to the Keys from Central Florida. Uh, I've been doing it commercially since 1978. I helped put my way through school doing it, but then moved down here in 78. I've been doing it since then. Movies such as Finding Nemo create the desire among many viewers to have a piece of the reef in their own neighborhood. And watching and learning about colorful fish and other sea life can create a lifelong appreciation for coral reefs and a desire to protect them. Billy Cossey, once a marine life collector, is now superintendent for the Marine Sanctuary Southeast region, which includes the Florida Keys. In 1971, he and his wife Laura opened a saltwater aquarium store in Tampa. They were at school studying biology and the aquarium they built became a learning tool and an inspiration. But what we were doing were capturing angelfish, butterfly fish, jawfish, hamlets. We were capturing all kinds of, of local marine life and we were shipping them to people all over the United States. We had customers in Chicago and Illinois in the, in the aquarium stores that knew every species off of our 400 species price list and they knew them by scientific name and common name, yet they had never seen the ocean. And they had customers that had never seen the ocean. So we realized the value of a marine, of a marine aquarium and it was like having little windows to the sea in Chicago or in St. Louis to where the people in the middle America area were able to appreciate the Florida Keys. But like commercial and recreational fishing, removing marine life from the oceans for the aquarium trade could prove harmful to the coral reef ecosystem if left unregulated. Fortunately, in the state of Florida, the marine life industry, state officials, and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary have come together to make sure that aquarium hobbyists who buy marine life from Florida are not harming the reefs they so admire. It was actually the marine life collectors and the leaders in that industry that stepped forward to get better management. And, and through this, we started setting up size limits and bag limits and working with the state of Florida to manage the industry as a traditional fishery, just like the hook and line fishery or just like the lobster fishery. about 50 to 75 full-time collectors in the Keys. That's people that make most of their income off of tropical fish. It's pretty much a closed fishery now. There's a fishery management effort that went into effect in July of 2005 that uh, really cut back the number of licenses, commercial licenses that are available. Still today, people wonder, how can you be a, the, the superintendent of a National Marine Sanctuary and still have all these people out there taking angelfish and butterfly fish and, and, and sponges and all of, it, all of this marine life? But just like any other fishery, if it's managed right, it can be sustainable. The National Marine Sanctuary program is a multiple use management program. Our job is to look after the protection of the resources and the water quality that supports the marine life here, whether it's for food fish or for an aquarium. One way the sanctuary maintains a balance is by setting aside areas where collecting ornamental species is not allowed, a practice known as marine zoning. Like zoning on land, marine zoning permits heavier use in some sections of the sanctuary, while allowing other areas to return to a more natural state. I don't go to any of the dive shop, dive shop areas, places where the dive shops dive. I stay away from them. I don't want to take the fish that they're trying to sell for people looking at. Some of our most valuable observations come from the marine life collectors that spend uh, dozens of hours every week underwater, thousands of hours a year 
looking, observing, and, and really taking note of what's happening with our marine life. A number of people that actually are on the ocean floor every day making their living, but are willing to take their time at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night and send me a little email saying, by the way, did you know what I saw today on the reef? And it's those valuable observations that are helping us enormously. Niedemeyer, along with former collector Martin Moe, has taken his commitment to protecting the marine environment to a new level by representing his industry on the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council. When Congress designated the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in 1990, legislators recognized the challenge inherent in creating this balance, directing the National Marine Sanctuary Program to establish its first-ever Sanctuary Advisory Council for the new site. The Sanctuary Advisory Council is made up of representatives from all different fields, people from all walks and ways of life. Every member is drawn from the community, and they all have much to share. The Sanctuary Advisory Council is made up of representatives from all different types of people in the Florida Keys. There's commercial fishermen, there's backcountry guides, there's uh, salvage operators, there's tourist people, there's uh, the, the dive industry is heavily uh, represented. Uh, there's environmental seats, there's several environmental seats. The Sanctuary Advisory Council convenes once every other month for a full day. A wide spectrum of topics is discussed, and the group's thoughts and opinions are offered as advice for the sanctuary managers. While everyone on the council has an agenda, the advice posed by the advisory board is always respected and often assimilated. And when it comes to eyewitness accounts of changes in nearshore and offshore waters, the resource managers always listen to those who live their lives there. Whether it is less pollution flowing downstream or making sustainable choices when purchasing seafood, the people who live in other places do have an impact on the Florida Keys. Resource managers need to compel everyone to care about this environment. 40% of North America drains into the Gulf of Mexico. And there are people in Chicago and there are people in St. Louis that have some impact downstream. But it's the educational value. They also pay taxes. Those taxes support this nation's National Marine Sanctuary Program. It may be that the best way to protect an ecosystem is to leave it completely alone. No human activity. But commercial and recreational fishing help to drive the economy of the Florida Keys. It is resource managers' goals to achieve a sustainable use of our marine resources.